All right. Welcome back to the Pursuit of Property podcast. Today, I'm sitting here with my co-host, Scott Farrell. A little bit of a different episode. We've got a different episode type we're kind of introducing today. We've done our book reviews, which I think have really been helpful for our listeners and uh, watchers of the podcast, whether they're listening or watching on YouTube. Uh, But today, we're actually taking a deep dive into, you know, one of the you know, great motivational speakers, Jim Rohn. And if you guys do a quick Google search, um, uh, our focus for today is going to be the attitude diseases that Jim Rohn has talked about. So, uh, Scott, how you doing this morning? Dude, I'm doing really good. We've got one more week until the wedding. We are in full crunch time. Yep. You and I are talking at growth track right after this. We've been promoting growth track uh every month and now we're actually guests on it uh but things are good man we're moving along and we're coming into a time where interest rates are still going up even more and attitude's going to be a big part of how you make it through the last quarter of the year so timing couldn't have been better yeah a hundred percent um especially this past week um i i was looking at one of the mortgage updates uh the week prior to when we're recording this i think uh, conventional rates were around 6.25. And then at, at the start of this week, they had jumped all the way up almost to 6.9% for uh, conventional, which is crazy. I think, like you mentioned, this last quarter, as we you know begin to enter October for the final push of the year, um, you know, it, it's the out people's outlook is going to be grim. key. Yeah. And uh, a, a lot of people's outlook right now is grim. You know, we, we don't like to hold that outlook uh, a big driver on why we want to talk about these kind of seven key, you know, attitude diseases that we want to avoid and really finish out the year strong and keep the outlook strong. Yeah. I mean, look, negativity's out there right now. Um, and it's just, it's important to acknowledge that, yes, there's like things going on in the market that aren't perfect for everybody. Um, but at this point, you have to actually acknowledge it and work through it. And you can't just keep looking away and saying the interest rates aren't going up, right? So, and the same with, um, you know, if you're a seller and prices might be coming down a little, or if you're an agent and business might be slowing down a little, th- 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 at this point, you know, you can't say that it's not happening and that might cause a lot of negative thoughts. So we're going to work to help you uh, acknowledge what's going on, but not dwell in it. So um, let's, let's dive into our first one because something you mentioned, I think ties in perfectly. Let's talk about if you are uh, an agent out there, an investor out there, uh, any kind of entrepreneur, business owner, and, and business has either taken a downturn, things are slower now than they were before, right? But the first attitude disease that you, know, you, you can't get caught up in is indifference, Right. So if you are the business owner or entrepreneur who is sitting here and going like, yeah, things are slow, but hey, you know, kind of shrug my shoulders and and, uh, you know, kind of not giving any second thoughts, that is going to be especially detrimental. Right. Yeah. You've what, what Jim Rohn talks about is you've got to get worked up. Right. If you are sitting in a spot as a business owner where business is slow, you're not making enough money as you like to or as you were before get worked up, go out and, and figure out what you need to do to skyrocket and and continue being successful in growing your business, right? Don't get caught up in the indifference, kind of the shoulder shrug, kind of being like, well, you know, this is kind of just how it is. I'll wait till things get better, right? No, get yourself worked up, go figure out what you need to do to continue building your business and, and, and making the cash flow for your business. Yeah. I mean, you can't sit around and wait for stuff to change, especially if you're a business owner, if you're an investor or an agent or whatever, right? Like if the market's changing, the market's changing and you have to have an opinion on it and people are going to look for you, uh, look to you for an opinion. And if your opinion is really, really lackluster, nobody's going to work with you because a leader needs to be the person who, you know, pushes the group forward. So if you think to yourself, this is good because of this reason, make that part of you and start embodying it and taking action on it. Say to yourself, this is really good for people because now they can actually sell a home and buy a home at the same time. They might not get the rate that they like on their new home, but you can refinance. And that's great. You've at least set yourself up to be action oriented and not be sitting around with no opinion at all or, you know, even probably worse is just not caring at all. 
right? Like, if you don't care, get out of the business. That's just how it goes. Well, and in my mind and in my opinion, this is probably the the number one driver that's going to determine if people are going to make it through this downturn or not, you know, business owner or not. Um, you know, if you're sitting there, we, we've talked about it on plenty of podcasts. We've had guests, you know, hammer this concept in when we've had them on the show. You know, whatever you were doing before kind of this this shift in the market or this downturn happened, in order to just keep that same level of business and activity, we know we, we've got to at least double the amount of stuff we're doing, right? So if you are sitting there indifferent, kind of shrugging your shoulders, telling yourself, hey, you know, it's it's just a shift, you know, it, you know I, I'll be... I'll be on the way back up after this is all done, right? You're not going to be in business long enough to, to, to find yourself back on the uptick, right? So yeah. I think that's going to be key. People not to be indifferent, not to be stagnant, really going in and, and figuring out what you need to do to double down on your income generating activities um, and, and all of that stuff, I think is going to be super important. Yeah. And, and the other part to it is, you know, it's like you're better to be wrong and have an opinion and get out of the business and, and say, this is, you know, real estate's going to take a dump, you know, at least get out and do something else with your life than sit around and try to wait. You know, you're not doing much for yourself or society by sitting in the real estate industry, um, not selling homes or not flipping anything and just kind of waiting for something to change. It's really not a great way to live. Yep. Absolutely. Um, well, let's jump into the next one. Yep. Indecision, like analysis paralysis is what we always say. But, you know, the inability to actually make a final decision is one of the big attitude uh, issues that we, we see a lot, especially in our business. Yeah, I think, you know, we've talked about this a lot. We've had a lot of people talk about this is, you know, people just you, you've got to go out and, and take action. Right. Not everything is going to be set in stone. Not, you know, when you're doing all, all of your research or you're, you're trying to get everything perfect. All the stars need to align before you can make the jump and take action. That never happens. The stars are never going to be perfectly aligned in any situation for, for you to go out and have the perfect opportunity to go and do that one thing or go and start that business or whatever it is. Right? So being able to understand, Hey, I've just got taking action is, you know, h- half of the battle, if not more. Right. So not letting yourself get caught up in the analysis paralysis, not letting yourself get caught up in, in the indecisiveness. Right. Go out there and, and, and just do it, dude. Yeah. Like it, you can't get yourself caught up in, in that situation. Well, and it's funny because a lot of people will acknowledge that they're in analysis paralysis. They're like, yeah. uh, I've got too many options, but I don't know where to go. And the answer is any of them. Just pick one. You know, there was a saying about the happiest guy is the one who picks a decision and lives with it. Um, not the one who sits on the fence back and forth, you know, and, and especially with indecision in our industry, it's like shiny object syndrome and all that, you know, you think to yourself, well, what if I made a wrong decision? Because maybe I still kind of want this other thing, right? Or like, what am I going to do for my lead generation or how I'm going to go to work? What am I going to think? Right. That's the key thing about our attitude diseases. It's about how you think, you know, if you're thinking to yourself over and over and over, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, you're going to live in a business of not knowing, right? At least if you tell yourself, yes, we're in a recession and these are the things you do in a recession or no, we're not in a recession. These are the things you do to keep building new business or whatever you answer. You pick an answer and you go with it, right? You don't sit in the middle indifferent on, you know, unwilling to make a final decision because whatever reason, and then you don't get anything done. Yeah. And I think a big reason people get get caught up you know with indecision in this analysis paralysis it it stems from fear right i know um that both with personal experience and and obviously talking to a lot of people you know business owners people in the real estate space right i if i just jump in and and do this you know i'm scared that it's not going to work out or i'm scared that i'm going to lose money or you know, I'm scared I'm not going to be successful, right? But something that Jim touches on when, when he's talking about all of these attitude diseases is, you know, even if it turns out to be a, a wrong decision, 
right? Or it turns out to be it, you take action, and, and yes, you were right. It, it turns out you know you did you, you didn't end up being successful there, or maybe it wasn't the right decision to make, right? But those wrong decisions give you better experiences. Obviously, now you come in, it, they're all learning experiences, right? And it sounds redundant, you know, uh, and and it sounds kind of cliche, but really, it all of those decisions make you better equipped for making more decisions in the future, right? And taking action in the future and bringing in all of that experience with you. Right. And great things don't come to the people who don't take risk and try things, right? Like at some point, if you're making, if you're dealing too much with indecision because you have a couple options and you're concerned or whatever, like you're not going to get any benefit from any of the options if you don't pick one. So if you're sitting there and you're deciding, you know, am I going to stay in the business and get a new job or am I going to leave the business or am I going to try this new type of thing? Am I going to try this marketing? Whatever it is, make a decision. You'll find out fairly quickly what the correct answer was or if you hit the wrong answer. And at that point, you can make a change. And like you said, you come more prepared than before when you go back to that same decision. Yeah. And and jumping into number three, which I think ties into uh, number two really well, another you know, possible really big driver that that stems and, and leads to people being really indecisive is doubt, right? Self doubt. You know, not not only fear, but have not believing in yourself, not having the confidence to be, hey, I, I am gonna go and I'm gonna take action on this, whatever it is. I'm gonna go buy properties out of state. I'm gonna go and wholesale my fir- first property. I'm gonna go get my real estate license and help people buy and sell real estate, right? If you are not confident when you're making those choices, if you are coming from a place of doubt and self-doubt, not only is that going to damage you internally, that's going to project to everybody else who is in your sphere, in the industry you're, you're looking to help. If you are talking to a seller, uh, you know, a distressed seller with a dis- distressed property and you are experiencing doubt or self-doubt or you're talking to a clients to list their home or, or help first time home buyers. And you're coming across doubtful and, and not confident, right? People are going to pick up on that. People do not want to work or do business with people who are not confident in what they're doing and the choices they're making. Yeah. Well, and self doubt comes from not doing anything, right? We always talk about this. Confidence comes from doing the things that you say you're going to do over a consistent period of time. So if you're struggling with that self doubt, you have to jo- just go out and make a decision. I'm going to do this task, right? Then it could be little. This could be, I'm going to make my bed every morning. That's why that book is so good. You know, it could be little tasks, but you're building up self-confidence and you're lowering self-doubt, which doubt, especially self-doubt leads to, you know, ultimate failure. Because if you're even questioning yourself when you're doing the right thing, you're going to end up quitting doing the right thing, right? But if you have confidence, you're following through consistently, and then you might be doing the wrong thing if things aren't working, you'll know it's the wrong thing. And now you're going to switch to a different option, but be intentional about it and be serious about it and set your goal towards now. I'm going to try this form of whatever it is. Right. Yeah. And and now a a lot of, you know, some people might be saying, you know, all the stuff we just talked about is a lot easier said than done. Right. Especially, you know, somebody who has, uh, you know, both of us who have experienced doubt and self doubt in the past, right. Somebody who might be feeling that way now, uh, you know, being like, yeah, all this sounds great. How, you know, but, but how do I get there? Right. And I think Jim makes Jim Rohn makes an important point in saying the process starts with understanding your self worth, right? So understanding your self worth, you are worthy. You are confident. You are good enough to go and take this or go and do this or, you know, take action and, and, and do these things, right? So understanding self-worth is going to be the beginning of this process to beating down and eliminating self-doubt. Yeah. Well, and this is like a super cringy phrase, but he had one in a different video I heard. And it was like, doubt your doubts, but believe your beliefs, you know? It's like, well, if I'm concerned about myself or my ability to do something, question why am I concerned about it? And then when you have a belief that I am this person, truly believe it and actually work on it. So if you say to yourself, I'm going to be successful. And then when you have those thoughts of I'm, you know, I could fail. Well, what is, why would you give more value to I could fail than I am going to be successful, right? So yeah. conquering self-doubt is one of the key things here. And it's not, like you said, it's not easy, 
but it's worth it, right? Yeah, I, I had not heard that before, and I think that's really good. Doubt your doubts and believe in your beliefs. That's cool. I, I like, like that. It's a cringy phrase, but it makes sense. Like, why would I spend so much time giving so much weight to something that I thought of the exact same way I came up with the idea that I'm going to be successful, right? And you think to yourself, oh, I'm being logical. You know, I failed in the past. Well, yeah, you failed in the past. You've done a lot of shit, you know? Look at where you are now. The fact that you're still alive means you did something, right? If you're sitting, you know, listening to a podcast, you clearly had the right thought process to at least get here, you know? And so why would you tell yourself that you're a failure, you know? And why would you give it any leverage? Doubt that. And then when you say, I'm going to be successful, or I'm going to cold call, or I'm going to go sell a home, believe it, you know? Tell yourself, well, you know, when I wake up in the morning, do I tie my shoes? Yeah. Well, then why wouldn't I be able to go wake up and go sell a house? You know, you have to just start ingraining it in yourself that if I'm going to say it, I'm going to do it and start developing that self uh, confidence. Now, in, in staying on this for a little bit uh, real quick before we move on, I think, um, you know, there from people I've talked to, it's kind of 50 50 on affirmations, right? People, if you don't know what an affirmation is, it's basically, you know, taking something like this. I, I am going to go and wholesale my first property. Being able to affirm that to yourself, speaking it loudly, whether it's standing in front of the mirror every morning, every night, right? Reading these affirmations. Um, I know some people who do them, some people who swear by them, some people who don't, right? But in, in my opinion, affirmations, there's no way affirmations hurt your self-worth or, you know, make your self-doubt even more, right? I think affirmations can only help you with your self-worth and only help you with that confidence. So exactly like you were saying, whatever you're going to do, when you say it, you've also got to believe it. And I think that's, you know, a good tool for people who may be experiencing or maybe stuck in kind of the self-doubt circle um, or, or feel, you know, kind of that self-unworthiness. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's also kind of a good best practice. It, it could be a good place to start. Yeah. Well, and, and your brain is just a factory of thought, right? And what you pour into the factory is what you will get out. So, I mean, for example, I have a roommate now who watches football. I don't care about football, but I've watched more football in the last you know few weeks than I have in the last few years. And I start noticing that I remember more people. I know more things. I'm talking about it with my buddies. And it's like, wow, imagine if I spent time pouring positive thought into my life would I be more positive? And the answer is 100% yes. And if you're trying to think, well, what do I add to my life to make it better? First, start with what you don't freaking like, right? If I don't want to be negative, remove complaining, remove that kind of thought. And we'll talk about that. But if you know you want to do better financially, well, start removing yourself from the situations that allow you to spend money or waste money, right? And start pouring into learning how to make money or learning how to be helpful and those kinds of things. It's just, it's an easy in and out process, right? Yeah. What you pour into your brain is what you will find. Yeah. A hundred percent. And let's bridge that into number four, uh, the fourth attitude disease, which is worry, right? A little bit different than the ones we've talked about. Um, but I think one of the most self-destructive, uh, you know, being worry, right? Because if you are always coming from a place of worry, one, you know, Jim talks about, you know, not only, you know, scientifically it causes health problems, right? If you are in a constant state of worry, right? That's number one, damaging your actual physical and mental health there, right? Yeah. But not only that, but social problems, family problems, right? Nobody wants to be around a worry, worry wart, right? Nobody wants to be around somebody who's constantly worrying about, all of the bad things that could happen or, yeah. you know, uh, all of the things that won't or, you know, won't happen. Right. Yeah. So if you're catching yourself in, you know, this worry, whether you're, you know, let, like I said, let, let's kind of backtrack to the example we're using with a business owner or an entrepreneur where things are a little bit slow right now. Right. If you are sitting in the state of worrying about where your next paycheck is going to come from or how you, you know, are, if you're just putting yourself in this constant state of worry, 
you're not going to be able to dedicate not only your mental space, but your skills into going out and making sure you're doubling down on the income generating activities to continue to grow your business. If you're sitting there spending all your time worrying about where your money's going to going to come from, it's never going to come. Right. No, and it's 100% right. I mean, I'm not going to claim that I've solved the worrying problem. I no, definitely no. deal with it. Um, but what I will say is the first time that I really saw a slowdown in my business was all self-inflicted and it was all self-worry. I had had a little run of good deals and I had spent that time where I was getting escrows and then I was worrying myself to death that I'd spend eight hours a day concerned about what if I lost this one deal instead of working on finding the next stuff. And then I went through a six month period where I had no, you know, no money coming in. Well, all of a sudden I went and got a second job that relieved the worry of, can I pay my bills this month? And all of a sudden, things opened up. And it's just interesting that I don't think that was coincidence. I mean, you've seen it happen too. A lot of people have seen that happen. So why why waste all that time worrying about what could happen when you could spend your time focusing on what could happen that's good and focusing on how could I make the good happen? Bad stuff's going to happen. I mean, this is how it goes. So worrying about it just makes your heart weak, makes you sleep worse. It makes you more irritable. Nobody wants to be around you when you're a worrier. You made you made a good point too. You know, we don't claim to, you know, have solved the worrying problem completely, right? And, and I think inherently, uh, you know, it, you can never a hundred percent solve your your worries, right? The important takeaway and the important part I think here is trying to minimize the worry as much as you can, right? And you know, it's definitely, you know, the, what, one of the last things Jim said about this attitude disease, what, Hey, you know, being an open and honest, you know, giving up worrying or try to trying to minimize your worrying is definitely not easy. I, I we know, right. Um, but the more you minimize it, the more that it is worth it. Right. So I, I, I don't think it's, uh, it, this is one of those things where you come in and you eliminate it completely. Cause I, 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 I do think worry, you know, it does pop up and it will pop up throughout life, right? But it's being able to recognize it, minimize it, and move past it. I think those are the three the three keys and the three takeaways there. Yeah. Overall, I mean, this is probably the most deadly of all yeah. of your attitude diseases. If you're a worrier, you're, you're setting yourself up for some really, really tough years. Um, let's jump in. Worrying also, uh, it causes a lot of these a lot of these come from worrying another one's over caution it's the worrying about the what ifs which you know jim kind of coins the uh the poor language or what is that what he called it uh so yeah something like that i think yeah i don't want to misquote him yeah but it was the the language of the poor was something like mm -hmm. that right mm -hmm. and it's the what ifs are going to always eat you alive because there's always opportunity for things to go wrong right Life's risky. He has like this whole little line. You guys probably, probably heard it if you are on like TikTok or anything. He's like, the second you're born, it's risky. You know, everything that you do is risky. Everything and he goes through. He's like, marriage is risky. Kids are risky. Business is risky. Um, at the end of the day, you can't get away from it. So, you know, over caution, you're, you're being cautious about stuff that's going to go wrong. You know, you just have to decide that you're going to get through it. Yeah. It, he says, you know, you have to give opportunities a go and get out of your comfort zone. And something I've heard for a long time, I'm sure you know many of you guys have also heard it too, is growth begins at the outside of your comfort zone, right? So if you are constantly in your bubble, in your comfort zone bubble, right? There's no opportunities for growth there, right? You're not doing anything different. You're not going out and trying different opportunities or going and chasing other opportunities, right? As long as you are inside, you know, that personal, uh, you know, bubble that is your comfort zone, there's never going to be any growth, whether it be personal growth, business growth, um, it, anything like that, right? So growth begins at the outside of your comfort zone. If you are constantly in this, you know, state of being really, really overly cautious, really wanting to stay inside of your comfort zone, you're never going to go anywhere. Yeah. Being overly timid is not a virtue, right? Being overly timid is to be scared, right? You know, at the end of the day, if you want to go start a business, there is no way to be certain that it will work. But on the converse side, if you're an employee right now, there's a lot of layoffs happening. 
you are not secure either. There is no greener grass in the one that you water. So you're going to spend all this time worrying about what could happen and being overly cautious and risking, you know, any opportunity of success by being secure. You know, if you, I try, I don't want to quote him too much, but he has a lot of good quotable lines. He's saying, if, if you think investing's risky, wait till you get the bill for not investing. If you think about all the people who bought houses in 2020, right? The start of 2020 when everything was going to shit, they made a ton of money and they got into a house at a much better time than anybody who bought right after them. And guess what? If the market tanks 20%, they'll still have equity. Well, everybody back then was saying, that's too risky to buy a house. The market's going to tank. The same is for anybody who's working to do any development now. Like there, you're going to hear people who are going to say, don't go start a new business. You're in the middle of a recession. Isn't real estate bad right now? That's the time you get in. When everybody else is being overly cautious, you need to take a chance on yourself. Don't do it recklessly. I'm not saying go do stupid shit, but if you've prayed on it, you've thought about it, you have self-confidence and you're willing to take the risk and you understand that things don't always work out, go do it. That's the only way you're going to find greatness. You're not going to find it from listening to the people who you don't want to be like. Yeah. Wrapping this up with, you know, the what ifs like that, right? You know, somebody might be sitting there. What if I go try this real estate thing and put my all into it and I fail, right? And and being in this overcautious state and that person never goes on, you know, to try that opportunity and go all in on that opportunity. I think you've got to change that what if question to yourself, right? Change it to what if you go and you succeed, right? What if 10 years go by and you could have been in a completely different place in your life, but now instead, because you didn't go and go all in and do that opportunity that you wanted to do, you're still in the same freaking place you were 10 years ago, right? So I think doing that spin, asking yourself that different what if question, right? What if, what if you do go and succeed, right? Not, not being, uh, leading into number six, not being pessimistic, right? Not asking yourself, what if I go and I don't succeed? What if I go and I, and I lose everything, right? Um, so let's lead it into number six, coming from a place of pessimism. Uh, pessimistic people are another group of people that are not very fun to be around, right? Right. So, you know, and and this comes down to, we've all heard the analogy, kind of the glass half full, is it half empty, right? You know, so I, I, I'm telling you, it, it, it can be easier to kind of be a glasses half empty kind of a person, right? It, it's kind of the easy way out, right? It's, it's easier to tell yourself, you know, yeah, glasses half empty, right? But right. Being able to make that personal shift to, you know, being that half glass, uh, half full kind of a person, right? And, and coming from a place of optimism, coming from a place of confidence, right? Um, it is really important. Yeah. Well, and some people, uh, there's people who are close to me in my life who I'll be like, dude, you're being a a pessimist. And they're like, no, I'm being a realist. (laughs) If you call yourself a realist, I just want you to know you're a pessimist. (laughs) Uh, Here's, here's the deal. Like the guy who says that the glass is half full has still acknowledged that there is a chunk missing. We're just focusing on what's good about the situation. And we're not going to let ourselves worry about what's bad. Like you can acknowledge again, like this, none of this is about pushing away negativity. It's about acknowledging it and handling it, not dwelling in it and letting it run you. Right. If you're a pessimist, you're spending all of your life blaming other things. You're finding fault and you're not ever looking for virtue. And that's a real problem. You know, you're never going to see the good in you if you're a pessimist because you're always going to see the bad. And I'll tell you what, there's always going to be bad stuff about you. I suck at basketball. I could do a lot to get better at it, but I don't really want to. So for the rest of my life, I'm going to tell myself I'm bad at sports. No, I'm not great at basketball, but I would still call myself an athlete because I'm an optimist, right? Our goal is to always see the benefit of the situation. You Just because you failed at a deal doesn't mean that you failed at your job. Just because you had a bad week doesn't mean you had a bad year. You have to focus on, okay, what did I do right? And again, we're not saying completely ignore what you did wrong. But acknowledge it and then focus on the good because what you pour into yourself is what you will get out. 
Yeah, you made a point earlier, um, you know, in the business sense, right? Or, or anything you go and try to do, what you put in is what you're going to get out, right? And I think the same can be said with, you know, our own personal attitudes, the things we say, how we carry ourselves, the things that we put out into the world, right? If I am a pessimist and I'm constantly putting pessimism out into the world, out into my sphere, right? I'm going to attract all of that pessimism back, right? I, I'm not going to be a, a, attracting good things back into my life. If I am constantly putting out all of this pessimism, you know, you're going to attract, you're going to get out, you know, what, what you're putting in, right? So I think making that attitude shift, making that life outlook shift, you know, changing yourself from the glass half empty to the glass half full type of person, uh, you know, again, for somebody, it, it can be hard because, you know, you may, you know, inherently be the, be the pessimistic person, right? And, and then, but I think being able to catch yourself and, and nothing happens overnight, right? It, it's a muscle that needs to be trained, right? Because a lot of things that go into this, it, you know, it can be, you know, your up, upbringing, how, are your ra- how you were raised, the people you were surrounded around uh, or surrounded with, right? If you were surrounded and in, in, in that type of environment, for, for a very long time, it, it's not going to happen overnight to make this mindset shift, right? But it, it's a muscle that needs to be trained. It's a muscle that once you do make that shift, I think not only is your quality of life going to improve uh, a, a, across the board, I, I think it, it then helps you with all of this other stuff, your self-worth, your confidence, all of these things come from making that mindset mindset shift. Dude, I love these podcasts, man. I, the last two weeks, I've been more fired up about the topics than some of our other topics. And I think what you just said is like really key. I was just thinking back while you were talking, because you and I are going to be talking in a minute here about mm-hmm. our, our story starting. Yeah. The people that we surrounded ourselves at the start with really affected us. And man, did we get lucky. And what we're building here is an intention to try to build optimists and people who are surrounding you with good stuff. And I think, just like you said, the programming's really hard to get out. But four years in, I think you and I are both at a much better place than you know where we were when we started. A hundred percent. And there is no question that the consistency of training these muscles has been the key part. Yeah, uh, ab- absolutely. And I think that that first step, right? You mentioned we we got really really lucky with the people we were able to be surrounded with. You know, getting started in this business. I think you know that that can be somebody's step one, right? Take yeah. a look at your inner circle. Who who are you surrounded with? Who are you spending time with? Who are you um, absorbing information from? Because if it's from pessimists and people who are not successful, people who are not driven, people yeah. who um, you know are, are just not inherently doing good for any good for you in your sphere, right? You've got to make that shift to surround yourself with the right type of people. And I think that, uh, it will be and and is really key to helping your own personal growth in in that sense. Yeah. Getting out of the pessimism, it's key to not be around pessimists. Mm -hmm. And again, you and I need to clarify, we say successful, we don't mean financially successful. We mean successful in whatever realm you want to be successful. If you want to be uh, extremely spiritual, well, then success is defined as the person that is extremely spiritual, right? Not necessarily the guy who makes the most money or who has the most power, or whatever, right? So if you want to get better at pessimism, surround yourself with optimists. And there are a lot out there. Now, last one, com- complaining, crying, whining, uh, and murmuring, which murmuring is, I think, a biblical term. Um, it ties hand in hand with, with pessimism. If you want to be less pessimistic, you can't complain all the time. Complainers are losers. That's it. If you complain all the time, all you're going to find is something to complain about. And the more you find to complain about, the more you're going to lack the mental capacity to find the good. And the more you lack the capacity to find the good, the less deals you're going to find, the less business you do, the less happy you'll be in, the less friendships, relationships, success, whatever you want, it's going to go down the drain. Complaining is the evil little block that builds up into the big monster. Yeah, we've had this conversation more than a few times. And again, just like uh, the groups of people that fall into some of these other attitude diseases, complainers are exhausting to be around, 
right? If they're, I mean, j- just take it. I mean, I'm sure those of you who are listening or watching, you, you've you got at least one person that came to mind when we, <laughs> when we brought up complaining or complainers, right? It, you know, think about just being around people like that. Somebody who's always finding the bad in the situation, complaining about this or that, being nitpicky and just, you know, being that, you know, whiner or complainer, mm-hmm. right? They are not fun to be around, right? It, 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 at least with me, when I'm around a complainer it, it, and I'm, I'm constantly hearing this complaining and the, it, or complaining, excuse me, and the whining, it's just like, dude, I, I, I don't want to be around you. Can't, like, just stop, <laughs> right. right? Because, again, you know, coming from that place of, oh, you know, the world is out to get me. Everybody's out to get me. I'm going to complain about this or that. Or, um, dude, there is, ev- there is always something to complain about always something yep. to complain about right if you are spending your time sitting there and complaining about everything again you're gonna get caught up in in that complaint that you know repetitive circle right complaining pessimist complain you know so and you're never gonna break out of it yeah. so don't be a freaking complainer please please <laughs> i want to even look at the right side think about how good it feels when you work with somebody and you ask them to do something and they say yes in an energetic and positive way and then it gets done how good do you feel and how much better do you feel when they ask you in return to do something? If everybody that you work with is really, really good about not complaining and you say, can you do this? And say, absolutely, I'm on it. And then they do it and they come back to you and ask you to do something you don't want to do. It's going to be so much easier for you to say it with a smile on your face and actually be happy about what you're doing. Like in our business, in any business that you're starting, if you're not happy, you're not going to succeed. Like if you're not doing something that you actually like, it's way too much work to do something that you don't like. And if you have complainers around you, get them out of your life. If that means firing them, if that means not working for them, if that means leaving an office, if that means whatever, it could be family, friends, hopefully it's not your spouse, but it could be a lot of people. Get rid of them. They're replaceable, right? And, and you know, we're talking about protecting your brain and what you're putting into your brain. If you're hearing complaints a lot, you're just going to start creating a factory that starts looking for the, you know, vices and issues, you know, and it's never looking for what's going right. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I think, you know, these are that, that was the last of our seven attitude diseases we were going to touch on. And, and I want to emphasize, um, you know, something I hit on a little bit earlier, but obviously all of these attitude diseases, right. That, that they are exactly what they're called. They're, they're a disease, right? All of these things, they're all negative, right? And I think, um, you know, to, to get close to wrapping things up here, Jim Rohn says something that I, I think is really important to keep in mind, especially after talking about all of these in depth, right? You know, negative is normal, right? It, negative is not successful, but it is normal and it's always going to be a part of life, right? All of these things we talked about, all of these different attitudes, at one point or another, you know, you are going to have them. People in your life are going to have them, right? But to emphasize again, I think the goal is not to eliminate these entirely because they all that the, they will continue to pop up here and there, whether it's with you or with people in your life. I think the goal is to recognize, hey, it is normal. It, it All of these things are a part of life. But what can I do to minimize all of these things? What can I do to minimize my attitudes falling into one of these seven? What can I do to minimize having people surrounded or surrounding myself with people who are also not finding themselves caught in in these attitudes consistently, right? So acknowledging that, hey, these things are going to be around. They're always going to be around. It's going to be impossible to never feel one of these attitudes or be surrounded by somebody who, you know, may have one of these attitudes now and then, but minimizing that being able to make, like we were talking about, put in the work to do the mindset, mindset shifts, surround yourself with the right people. Don't get caught in the rut. That is one of these attitude diseases because they can be detrimental. Yeah. And keep in mind, this is a battle that you're going to have to fight forever. At the end of the day, the negative thoughts will always pop up. There will always be negative people. And that's not a reason to just say, I'm going to give up. Right. And, uh, you know, just keep in mind, the more you focus on getting rid of this, the better your life will be. And you might have to focus on something else for a day, but just, you know, keep in mind that they'll crop back up and they come back just as fast as that you can get them out. Right. 
or faster, I would say. They can come back. So be careful about uh, thinking that you've beat one of these diseases. Always keep yourself in check. Remind yourself, okay, am I being indifferent? Am I being pessimistic? Am I complaining? Am I doubting myself? Am I, in, you know, in uh, indifference or analysis paralysis? Keep that in check because they come back. And like you said, it's normal, but it's not successful. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, I'm with you. I love these types of podcasts that we do and talk about because I don't. Th- this doesn't just fall into. It's not real estate specific, right? Uh, not real estate investing specific. Not even entrepreneurship specific, right? This is life specific. So anybody who's listening, watching, no matter where they are, what they're doing, right? Listening to all of these things and recognizing all of these things, I think it brings it. It, it will bring people value. You do not. That, that's what I like about these episodes, man. That they are they apply to anybody and everybody who's listening. So um, I know we've got uh, the big week coming up next week. Like you said, where we are at the week before the wedding at the time of this recording. Uh, next week, though, we are finally, and I'm super pumped, we've got two really, really dope guests coming in. We're finally going to be able to do the uh, your flip update, kind of the uh, the follow-up episode, breaking in and getting to, yep. into all the numbers. And then having, uh, for that one, we're going to have your dad come on, who yeah. was your business partner on, on, on the flip. And the other guest we're having on, somebody who's been instrumental into our businesses growing and flourishing, is your brother-in-law, Colin Dorner, yes, who sir. has been helping us inside and out with our businesses. Uh, really, really smart dude. Amazing guy. I think we've got two really great guests coming in next week. I'm definitely partial, but I think I agree. <laughs> They're both from out of town, so we'll have to thank them for making the trip in. But yeah, and then after that, we'll have uh, more episodes coming up down the line, but we don't have to worry about that yet. We're uh, we're getting through the next few weeks. Yep, absolutely. Well, thank all of you guys who are out there listening and watching to this episode of the Pursuit of Property podcast. We will see you next week. Thanks, guys. <laughs>